bar mode. Invincible. Scale. Shadow Caster. I hope you all enjoyed that trailer, and special thanks to Jeff Steitzer for lending his voice for parts of the trailer. And I also want to thank Trusty Snooze, General Trex, Gamer Garden, and other members of the MCC Game Typers Discord for helping me with this project. I would not be able to get it done without their help. And of course, I want to thank the Anvil server as well for their help with playtesting and feedback. And, as you might be able to tell by the title of this mod, this is the Anvil server's new official forge tool for Halo Reach. The link for their Discord will be in the description box below. Also in the description is the download for Anvil Editor and all the game types associated with it. And since I suspect that at least some of you don't want to sit here and listen to me ramble on about the mod for the next however many minutes, I'll give you a quick rundown and you can get straight to forging. Anvil Editor is a forge game type mod, which means that, like any other game type mod, it can be played by PC and Xbox players alike, only the host needs to have the mod downloaded in order for everyone to play on it, and it's custom games browser compatible. Or at least, features of the mod that are found in the various custom games are compatible on the browser. You'll find in the description a download folder with a number of downloads on it. One of them is the Anvil Editor mod itself, which is a Forge game type, and the other is a number of base game types with the features of the editor added to them. It should be noted that only the Anvil Editor Forge game type itself can be used in Forge with the scripts active. All other game types will not run in Forge. That said, I've taken the liberty of including every base game type in Halo Reach, and that includes Invasion. Also included in the downloads below is documentation, which explains pretty much everything that this video does. All of the game types, including the Forge mod, are on my file share as well. Look up we see I, just like that. With all that said, good luck on your forging adventures, and for those who are still joining me, allow me to explain the where, the how, and the what of this mod. This whole project started way back in February of 2022. Around that time, it was discovered that you could run game type code in Forge. Now, the way this works is, normally game type code runs every single tick, and since it doesn't do that in Forge, we assumed that game type code just doesn't run in Forge. However, it was recently discovered that certain event triggers actually do cause code to run in Forge, at least once every time the event is triggered. In particular, the two events we're concerned with are the initial trigger, which runs code once at the start of every round, and the object death event trigger, which runs code every time an object dies. Now, death does not mean destroyed, so you can't have a fusion coil explode every single tick and expect code to run. But, what you can do is, say, spawn a kill ball using scripts, and spawn a monitor inside that kill ball. Then, when the monitor dies, spawn a monitor inside the kill ball. 
And then when that modder dies, spawn a modder inside the kill ball. And it dies and spawns and dies and spawns and dies and spawns and dies and spawns. And you can see where this is going. So, once you have an infinite object death loop, you can run code as though it were running constantly. The nice thing too about these triggers is that they can store almost any code inside of them without issue. So, we can run entire game types inside of Forge if we wanted to. And this started happening pretty quickly. Trusty Snooze was the first to take advantage of this though for actual modded content. First there was invasion editing game type, which is just regular Forge with invasion labels, but with real-time scaling. And then he took advantage of it for his Mythic Forge game type, which is just Mythic Slayer but in Forge. Both these game types have their own methods of starting scripts, and Anvil Editor also has its own method as well. Now, originally, I used a machine gun turret to start scripts. It was a very simple solution. Players could start scripts whenever and wherever they wanted to, and it ensured that the script running objects didn't spawn inside the wall or in the ceiling. But I wanted scripts to run automatically on all maps. So, I took Trusty Snooze's method for Mythic Forge and tried to modify it. With Mythic Forge, scripts start automatically. The issue with that method though, is that it only really works on certain maps due to the fact you have to spawn the kill ball and the objects relative to the very first object that appears on the map. On every single map, the first object to spawn is actually the skybox itself. So spawning things relative to that can cause objects to spawn inside of geometry or way out of bounds, or just somewhere where the kill ball is not going to be able to destroy the monitor. What I wanted to do was spawn the structure and have it rest at the very top of the map. Now, this is easier said than done, because the top of the map actually has two barriers. There is a physical barrier where the player and other objects usually cannot pass, but if you use an attach-detach loop, as I was doing, Objects can go past this and end up in a space between the physical barrier and the existence barrier. Objects in this space do not interact with other objects properly, so the kill ball script does not work. Therefore, I had to create a structure which would stop itself before the existence barrier and allow scripts to run. On top of that, I had to accommodate different map geometries. Pendants, for example, has a very low ceiling, so I couldn't spawn the object too high up or else it would be stuck in that space automatically. On top of that, I had to account for maps like Boneyard and Powerhouse, which normally spawn the object inside the mountain, and so I had to make it high enough so that they could spawn outside the mountain. The end result was that I had a structure which essentially acted as a twin set of prongs. The upper prong would push the entire structure up constantly, while the lower prong would just sort of be there running scripts. When the upper prong reached the ceiling of the map, it would get stuck and the lower prong would just operate from then on. Now, I did leave in the functionality to start scripts manually, and also to stop scripts by destroying a plasma cannon. So if you want to stop scripts, destroy a plasma cannon, and you can start scripts again using a machine gun turret. When you do this, the objects will move upward, just like they do when scripts start automatically, so if it's below a ceiling, it may get stuck on that ceiling, so try to destroy the turret in open area. You'll also get confirmation when scripts have successfully started, as the game will announce VIP. VIP. New VIP. Additionally, for maps that lack a kill ball, a landmine is used instead, which achieves a similar effect, but is less smooth than a kill ball. And so, after getting the kill ball script working, I got to work on implementing different forge labels. It wasn't actually that hard, you just had to copy and paste most of them, and I added some additional features to make it easier to forge with. Additionally, I added some quality of life improvements, such as being able to change species by changing teams, adding invincibility, permanent waypoints over players' heads, you get the idea. So, let's go over some of these features, shall we? Starting with the spawner label, this will spawn various items, or alter the forge object itself, depending on what the spawn sequence is. Spawn sequences 1 through 6 spawn various objective items. 
These are mostly for testing purposes, you can see where these items spawn in a custom game. Of course, these items will spawn in a custom game if you have the label set up properly, so keep that in mind for certain objective game modes. Spawn sequences 7 and 8 spawn a Spartan and Elite biped respectively. These bipeds are used for testing purposes, mainly for checking sight lines and scaling and things like that. Although, feel free to mess around with them with friends if you so desire. Don't let me stop you. Spawn sequences 9 and 10 spawn the Pelican and Phantom Scenery objects, at least on maps that support them. These objects are similar to the ones found in Forge, except that the turrets are not removed from them. So you can operate the Pelican's turret and the Phantom Plasma Cannons, but not the Phantom's front turret, unfortunately. Spawn sequences 11 through 13 spawn the three Warthog turrets. As expected, the Goss turret doesn't have the same physics as the other two, falling over and flipping around and not being able to turn properly. However, if the base objects team is set to blue team, then the Goss turret is fixed and properly rotates, although it does have normal physics compared to the other two turrets' phased physics. Spawn sequences 14 onwards spawn various items depending on what the map is. 14, for example, will spawn a phantom vehicle, which appears on maps like Forge World. Spawn sequence 15 spawns a long sword, which only appears on Boneyard. Spawn sequence 16 spawns a covenant power stand, which only appears on the Spire for holding the core. 17 spawns the Boneyard version of that for the UNSC core. And spawn sequence 18 spawns a resupply capsule in Anchor 9. Spawn sequence negative 1 turns the object into a distance checker. This measures the distance in real time between the object and the host player, unless the object is put on a different team, in which case it takes the first player on that team and checks the distance to them. Sequence negative 2 turns the object into a deletion zone, which will delete every object except for a monitor that enters its zone. This is not the same as deleting an object in Forge, and the objects will come back the next time the round starts. Spawn sequences negative 3 and negative 4 can be used to turn on the various interpolator states that are found on the maps. This can set off various custom animations depending on what map it's played on, and you activate these by changing the object's team, and a waypoint will tell you if the corresponding interpolator state is turned on or off. I'll be honest, I don't know if there are actually 8 interpolator states, or if there's even 5, but you can use this to check. Spawn sequence negative 5 will turn the object into a shadow caster, which means it will attach the object to a warthog turret, or monitor, which will allow it to cast a shadow. However, this also causes the object to lose collision with players, so it's not recommended to use this on objects that are going to be walls, unless you also add in a real wall on top of it. Spawn sequences negative 6 and negative 7 will activate the civilian feature found in Mythic Slayer. Spawn sequence negative 6 will disable a vehicle's weapons, while spawn sequence negative 7 will delete them outright. Scale functions identically to how it is in Mythic Slayer and Trusty's Invasion game type. For spawn sequences 1 to 100, the object will increase by 10% extra scale for each spawn sequence. Going in reverse, spawn sequences negative 1 to negative 10 will also decrease the object by a scale of 10%, down to 1% at negative 10. Beyond negative 10, the object continues where spawn sequence 100 left off, but increasing by 20% portions instead of 10%. Going beyond negative 80 will cause the object to scale up even more dramatically, resulting at negative 100 being the biggest you can make an object. Additional options are included if you set the scale to green team or orange team. Saying it to either these teams will produce shadow casters using either a warthog turret or a monitor. If you give a hill marker the scale label, it will turn into a scale zone. These scale zones will apply scaling to any object that enters its zone, including itself. If the object is on the gold team or the pink team, any objects that enter the scale zone will only be scaled once. This can be used to stop players from shrinking through objects due to repeated scaling. If the object is on the pink or brown teams, an alternate scaling is used. 
where 1 represents 1% scale and 100 represents 100% scale. On the negative side of things, negative 100 represents 200% scale. This is useful when you have excessively large objects, such as a Covenant Cruiser or a Skybox, and you need intervals of less than 10% in order to scale it. Another feature that comes directly from Mythic Slayer is the attach base and attachment labels. As the names imply, these allow you to take objects and attach them to a base object. Every attachment is attached to an attach base bearing the same absolute spawn sequence. So attachments of negative 1 and 1 will attach to an attach base of 1 or an attach base of negative 1. As with most attachments, the attachment has no physics, so the players can walk right through them, but they do still stop bullets and grenades. It also comes with a multitude of different options. On the attached base side of things, a negative spawn sequence with the attached base, alongside a zone, will allow the object to dynamically attach other objects to it that enter its zone. This zone is team dependent, so if you set it to something besides neutral team, it will only be able to pick up objects on that team. You can use this to restrict what objects the dynamically attaching object can attach. One other change from Mythic Slayer is that setting the spawn sequence of the attached base below negative 50 will no longer attach player bipeds. The big reason for this change was because of instability issues and also the fact that it is basically useless in actual gameplay. For the attachment label, negative spawn sequence do something special for vehicles. Vehicle cannons and some turrets will become detached from the attachment vehicle itself and attached to the attached base vehicle. This allows you to fire vehicle cannons from the primary vehicle, or use turrets while they're attached to the primary vehicle. You may notice that the attachment vehicle body remains even if it can't be used. Setting the spawn sequence to below negative 50 will scale the attachment vehicle body down to a scale of 1, effectively hiding it. Finally, if the spawn sequence is greater than 74, then players can enter the attached vehicle. I've been told there are connection advantages to this, however. Object by Index is a label that allows you to manipulate map objects by attaching them to a base object. This can also work on forge objects as well, so be careful when using this label. What constitutes as an object can be quite varied, as the skybox counts as an object, as well as many particle effects on various maps. So you can mess around with these quite a bit. Combined with scale zone and other labels, and you can create some pretty interesting contraptions. Object by Index also has a few options depending on what team it's on. If the object is on the red team, then the map object attached to it will detach itself. Note that this only applies in Forge. In custom games, the object will always detach at the start of the round, in order to prevent certain objects from not respawning for clients in the second round onward. Detaching the object can also be good because, for a hill marker, it will not render the object in custom games if it's attached to it because hill markers don't render either. There are a lot of possibilities you can get from forging map objects, and using things like scale zone can further increase the possibilities. Of course, I didn't implement all the game type label features at the same time, but once I'd gotten the majority of features in, I thought I might be close to finished with the project. But then, Gamergarden gave me the brilliant idea to add a toolbar mode. I won't go over every detail on how I made this work, but to summarize, I had to put the player in toolbar mode after they exit forge mode, and take advantage of the fact that players in Forge mode still have a player biped, but that's just invisible. As for Toolbar mode itself, there's a number of options available to players, some of which are obvious what they do, while others are not. Each option functions as a switch, and when you hit the switch, a message is played telling what the switch does, and giving off any warnings if necessary. To start with, we have the invincibility switch, which is applied per player. When turned on, the switch grants the player full invincibility in all modes. The bro spawn switch is applied for all players, and it enables or disables bro spawning, which does function in Forge. You can respawn on allied players if available, 
and if no bro spawn locations are available, then you will just respawn normally. The race switch will cause anyone in player mode to automatically gain and enter a mongoose. This is useful for testing race maps without having to spawn mongooses and later delete them. Also, if players do not want to race, they can simply get out of the mongoose. The scale switch will disable scaling for all objects under the scale label. This inversely applies to objects on the yellow team, so when scaling is disabled, their scaling will be enabled and vice versa. This is good for trying to determine collision, because with scaled up objects, collision does not normally scale. The attach switch will remove attachments from their attach base objects if the switch is enabled. This can cause garbage collection to occur if the attachments are spawned too far from their origin, so be careful with it. The shadow switch, when enabled, will disable shadows for shadow caster objects and allow those objects to be forgeable once again. And finally, the OBI attach switch will attach map objects back to their base objects. This is useful if the object is on red team, and the map object completely covers the base object due to it being solid, thus making it unforgeable. And thus concludes my explanation and tutorial for the Anvil Editor tool. There's a lot more I wanted to talk about in this video, but unfortunately, many of these features are just too small to mention, and this video is long enough as it is. Like I mentioned at the beginning, everything is available to download in the description, and all the game types, as well as the Forge tool itself, are available on my file share in MCC, VCI. Thank you to those who stuck around to the end of the video, and I hope to see your Forge creations on the Custom Games browser.